Okay, so um, we're uh, welcome back to Doctrine of the Church. Uh, since I'm uh, taking a vacation these two weeks, Joanna is very Lamb is very um, helpfully uh, stepping in uh, to give me a chance to rest, and also um, she has uh, studied uh, history. Um, at Catholic University, the university that I study at and knows a lot about church history. So I'm pretty excited to hear what she has for us this morning. And so um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Joanna. Okay. Um, can I get a volunteer to just bless us this morning before we start uh, talking about stuff? Volunteer to pray. Anybody? David Green, go for it. David, you're muted. Thank you for this time together. Father, this morning on the Lord's Day, we pray that you would be with us by your spirit. Bless Joanna. She speaks to us. We thank you that we have the history of the church as we do and can see your gracious mercy to thousands of people and over many generations. And so be with us today as we think about these things. May it profit be profitable for us and encourage us and Help us to grow in grace. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, you all have been dealing with the theory of church with Jamie. I'm sorry if I touch my table and my laptop uh, is getting wiggly. <laughs> you all have been dealing with the theory of the doctrine of the church. I'm going to call Jamie the theorist. Um, he's been telling you what church should be like. Uh, based on exegesis of scripture and Presbyterian theology. Um, but that's not what I do. I'm not here to tell you what church should be like. I'm, I'm here to tell you what the church was like at one point in its history and what it could have been like had the history taken another direction, had people made different decisions. So um, church history, I think I know most of you guys, you've, you've listened to me teach church history before, so I don't feel like I need a huge introduction. But church history is dynamic. Although we recognize that God is sovereign and ultimately in charge of what goes on in the church, um, real people make real choices in history that have a real effect on the outcome. And so I want to talk today and next week about one particular uh, time in church history when church government and even the future of the Reformation could have been very, very different. Um, so we're going to talk about that this week and next week. Uh, it's a theory in church government known as conciliarism. So uh, let me put this on my screen here. Share the right screen. All right. We're going to be talking about something called conciliarism. It was a theory of a church government that was present in the 14th and 15th centuries um, that it had a tremendous influence on the development of Presbyterian church government theory. And my husband, Jared, is joining us now. <laughs> you can see him. Um, it had a tremendous influence on the development of Presbyterian church theory in the 16th century and an influence on the Westminster divines when they sat down to write the Westminster Confession in uh, the 17th century. So we all know that basically Presbyterianism is the best way to govern a church, right? That's why we're all here. <laughs> um, but it's, it's certainly not the only way that the church has been governed in the past, um, not even the, the only way based on solid biblical exposition. So there's a couple of questions we go into talking about conciliarism. There were four questions that really occupied the minds of people considering the question of church doctrine, what does it mean to be the church uh, in the 14th century? Let me see if I can, here we go. So conciliarism. The first question is who is the head of the church? Now, does anybody have a good answer for who is the head of the church? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> How about on earth? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go with Jesus as the answer. That's what I expect from good Presbyterians. Um, in the 14th century, the answer was a little more complicated. 
of course, uh, the Pope was considered the earthly head of the church under the authority of Christ. I'll talk a little bit more about how it got that way uh, in a second. But that was the question that was concerning people in the 14th century. Is the Pope the head of the church or are there, is there, are there other people or other bodies that would be the earthly head of the organizational visible church? The second question uh, for conciliaris was what role do members play in the church? Now, somebody should have an answer to this because I believe Jamie gave a lecture on it a few weeks ago. So what role should members play in the church? They constitute the body of the church. So they are the they are the church and from them come their leaders or so it should be <laughs> right so this is a question that conciliarists are thinking about theorists uh theologians in the 14th century what role do members play in the church um are they simply the sheep under the headship of the pope and the bishops or are do they have an integral role to play in maintaining the visible church as an organization the third question was, what does reform mean? This is a really tangled, thorny issue that I'd like you to think about these next two weeks while we're talking. Because people for 2,000 years have been talking about reforming the church. When we say reforming the church, we tend to have a specific idea in mind of what that means based predominantly on the Reformation and what it meant to reform the church in the 16th century. But it looks different in every century, this idea of reforming the church. Does it mean just reform, making things better? Or does it mean reform as to uh, get rid of everything that's there and create something new in its place? The third, fourth question, sorry, what number I'm on. The fourth question is, what does it mean then to reform the church? Once you define reform, what does it mean to reform the church both in its head however you define the head of the church, and in its members, that is, through the membership uh, that's below. What does this look like, not just doctrinally, but in a practical sense? What does church government look like that's been reformed? What does the moral practice of the members of the church look like once it's been reformed? And how do these play off each other? Where's the authority coming from to reform the head and members? This is not a phrase we use a lot today, uh, reforming the church in head and members, but throughout the Middle Ages, uh, when various reformers in the church talked about ending corruption in the church and reforming the church, they always phrased it in head and members. In the 14th century, everybody believed, as just a matter of course, it was a generally accepted assumption that you had to reform the church top down, that you had to start with the head of the church, that is the Pope, and under him the bishops in order to reform the church, and then it would trickle down to the membership of the church. So we're gonna talk about the church reforming it in head and in members as we go through here. All right, there is still, we're, now we're gonna go back in history. We're gonna be the foundation. We're going all the way back to the beginnings of the church. Um, Although there is some scholarly debate still, and uh, Jamie can tell you more about it as well, about how the church functioned in its early centuries, by the fourth century, which is where I'm gonna come in with the Council of Nicaea, by the fourth century, the church functioned as an organized, visible uh, religion uh, that had what's called a tripartite ministry. That is, ministry existed on three levels. There were the deacons, the pastors or priests, and the bishops. Uh, this tripartite, right there, this tripartite ministry was explained as reflecting the roles of the Trinity in the government of the church. The bishops, as the the, the top of the three, governed the church as administrators and regulators. They were like the father in the Trinity in being sort of monarchs over the visible church. They would be overseers of a specific geographical area, a city and its attached provinces. Below them, the pastors, sometimes called the priests, uh, would serve 
the faithful on a regular basis in specific local congregations and they would bring the word and the sacrament to people on a regular basis every sunday frequently became more than every sunday and on weekdays as well below them were the deacons um and i believe jamie was in the middle of teaching you about the distinction between elders and deacons last week before i jumped in so you should have a good foundation for understanding this here but the deacons would serve as organizers of charitable outreach to the community they would take care of poor relief they would take care of the widowed and orphan in the congregation they would organize visits to those who were in prison they took care of that kind of physical ministerial outreach so that the pastors could devote themselves to the spiritual needs of the church and then the bishops would be overseers of a specific location we have basically these same three levels today only instead of calling them bishops we talk about having the presbytery and then the or, and, or the ruling elders and then the teaching elders in the local church and then the deacons so we sort of uh have changed our terminology from it but we have a general idea of this uh in even today however presbyterians emphasize the plurality of men to occupy each of the offices so instead of having one priest per congregation one pastor per congregation we have several instead of having one elder or bishop for a geographical area we have a whole board of elders that we call the session so presbyterians have emphasized the plurality essentially bishops in council with each other rather than bishops as sort of monarchs of local areas of the church however in the fourth century bishops were charged were individual they had a certain dignity and honor and responsibility over a local area for maintaining both the doctrine and the practice of the church against heresies against schisms against scandals of any kind so it was working pretty well through the first four centuries of the church the bishops and the priests and the deacons but there was a problem what do you do when each of these bishops who has essentially independent authority in his territory what do you do when these bishops disagree with one another how are you going to solve that question we have similar questions that arise today uh if, you know if, what do you do if your pastor wants a jet plane is that allowed this isn't a doctrinal question but it's a practical question that you might want to answer um is it okay for a pastor's wife one of puritans had a question is it okay for a pastor's wife to wear more than one gold ring if she has more gold rings on is she a scandalous woman that the church needs to discipline or not so these are real questions of practice that get brought up the bishops dealt not just with practice but with doctrine as well and in the fourth century three hundreds the church uh in 313 the emperor constantine made christianity legal uh in the roman empire and he was especially hopeful that he could use the christian church to promote unity within the empire which was falling apart by this time um but what he encountered after the legalization of christianity was that there was significant controversy among the bishops of every city in his far-flung empire there was major disagreement. Um, since you're all muted, I won't ask you, but you should ask yourself, do you know who caused this disagreement? It was a bishop, another bishop, so he had authority for maintaining doctrine and practice of the church. It was a bishop named Arius. And Arius had been teaching on essentially the doctrine of the Trinity. And Arius said that uh only the father god the father was truly eternal and truly divine he said that god the son was almost but not quite eternal and that he was of a similar substance with the father but not the same one this preaching of Arius caused huge uproar in the church Arius is preaching this other bishops are denouncing him so what do you do when you have bishops disagreeing um, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourselves and say, what would you do if you had bishops disagreeing? How would you solve the issue? Hopefully we'd go to the scripture before anywhere and to prayer. <laughs> okay, but if we, we go to the scripture, 
does the scripture have a verse that says the Trinity is to be understood in these specific terms? Not one verse, but in the whole, indeed. Right. <laughs> but there's no one verse. And oh. as we know from millennia of the church, it's easy for people to disagree on exegesis. We could say that the, the Bible is, is clear, its doctrines are open, and I, I agree with that. But there, there is disagreement when different theologians are reading scripture. Even today, you have theologians that disagree with each other, even though they're all basically reformed evangelical theologians. Um, I'm blanking on a controversy I can give you off the top of my head, but I know they're out there. <laughs> um, so what do you do when all of these people, all these theologians, these bishops, disagree with each other? You start a new church. <laughs> you start a new church. <laughs> that's frequently yeah, what we that's do today. Cool but, <laughs> so Constantine wanted to use the church as a source of unity in his empire. But with all of this uproar, it was causing public controversy and scandal among the pagans in the empire. So... The bishops went to Constantine and they told him that they had a very good biblical model on the way to solve differences, theological and practical differences, uh, between bishops. Anybody know what that biblical model is? Acts 15. Very good. So we're going to take a look at Acts 15 here. Uh, Constantine, the bishops read this and they said this would be the model for solving disagreements among the bishops. Acts 15 says, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. They, they were teaching the brothers, unless you were circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders uh, about this question. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. So the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider the mat this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the nook of all of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose from among them, choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and elders to the brothers and elders to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gotten, gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Paul, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Okay, that's Acts 15, 1 to 30. And it sets the precedent for what happens in the year 325 when the bishops gather, gather together um, under the call from Constantine to settle the dispute about the matter of Arius.
uh, about 300 bishops came to Constantine's call in the city of Nicaea. You all know Nicaea because of the Nicene Creed, and that's what comes out of this council that meets together. There are bishops from all over the empire, representing geographically the entirety of Christendom, and they are the bishops, the, the highest authorities in the church at that time, meeting for debate. So, going back to this Acts passage, let's look at some of the things that you might notice what the apostles did in Acts 15 that became the model for the bishops meeting in Nicaea in 325. For example, the apostles and elders, and in Nicaea the bishops, gather together in a council to hear both sides of the issue. That is, they don't make a decision without hearing in a more or less open debate uh, what the issues at stake are and the theological reasonings behind them. So the apostles and elders gather together in Nicaea and there's open debate. The, this is an important one. The apostles and elders in Acts and the bishops in Nicaea address both theological and practical questions. That is, they don't just address theology and leave the practice up to the individual churches, and they don't just address practice without addressing theology. In the letter from Paul and Barnabas, we see that they tell the churches about being saved through the grace of Jesus, but they also give them practical considerations about abstaining from the meat offered to idols and abstaining from eating things that have been strangled and from blood. So there's both doctrine and practice. And this becomes a model for Nicaea and others. When Nicaea issues its creed, um, as we have it today, we know it's primarily theological in nature. It addresses the doctrinal questions, but practice is also addressed in the later canons of Nicaea. What we see from this model that the bishops at Nicaea address as well is that they wrote down their decisions. They didn't just leave it as word of mouth teaching, but they created a letter that then they, they then sent out to local churches. So they, the bishops in council together debate questions of doctrine and practice. They make decisions in a more or less democratic fashion. They write down those decisions to send to the local churches. And the important one to notice out of this as well is that the local churches rejoiced in the decisions um, that were handed down to them, the decrees, and they decided to follow these decrees without more open debate. They were willing to trust the authority of the bishops in council. Any questions on Acts 15? I'll pause for a second. Okay, we have Acts 15 then provides this model, bishops in council writing down a decree and that becoming the authoritative uh, document that will govern the practice and the doctrine of the church. So the bishops who were gathered together at Nicaea in the fourth century decide to follow this biblical model. They meet in the city of Nicaea, which today is kind of a backwater, but at the time was a, a thriving city right in the center of the Eastern Roman Empire. It was quite an important town. Um, and all of these bishops from all over the world come together and they sit down and they have an open council in which they listen to Arius and his followers and they listen to Arius's detractors and his followers. And they make a decision. The decision at the time, of course, was to reject Arius's teaching. And when they wrote down this decision as a decree, they came up with the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed that we recite now. But the central passage of the Nicene Creed speaks to Jesus being co-eternal with the Father, being begotten, not made, and their key word, the, the great triumph of Nicaea, is describing Christ as homo ugis, that is, of the same substance with the Father, rather than as a similar substance. So they put down heresy while they're addressing questions of doctrine and practice, they write specifically against heresy. And it's a decision that's broad enough that there's some uh, kind of individual interpretations that still occur in the church. There's still disagreement among theologians, but the central tenets of faith have been protected. One of the, the most important triumphs of Nicaea is that they managed to defend biblical revelation in the creed without going beyond what the Bible has given us. 
um, it's an extraordinary accomplishment. They manage to limit what they say to the absolute essentials of the faith, but say it in such a way that there will be no debate no debate in the in the future about what constitutes the orthodox doctrines of the one holy catholic and apostolic church so that's nicaea and it becomes the model for later church disagreements after the areas question is settled naturally all the bishops don't just start agreeing with each other on every little detail so there still are controversies among the bishops in the church for the next 1,000 years, this conciliar model, or model based on government by councils, um, is assumed to be a proper biblical way of expressing the general will of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Authority for doctrine and practice was invested in the bishops meeting in council. Between 325 and 786, there were seven of what were called general or ecumenical, that is universally binding councils in the church. And these seven are generally accepted still as binding of uh, orthodox thought in the church. There have been some disagreement later, uh, the Council of Chalcedon, for example, the, those who disagreed with the Council of Chalcedon split off and formed the Coptic church. Um, today, most Protestants tend to reject the Seventh Ecumenical Council from 786, but on the whole, the decrees from these councils have become an important marker of orthodoxy in Christian doctrine and practice. In the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, which continued long after the Western Roman Empire collapsed and fell, this conciliar model remains even today. Uh, even in Eastern Orthodox churches today, it is the bishops meeting in council that have final authority for doctrine and practice in the church, rather than individual bishops or anything like a pope uh, in the East. So this conciliar model laid down by Acts and the Council of Nicaea becomes a model for how the church should solve her disciplines, her differences. But what happens in the West? The Roman Empire collapses, right? And we know the conciliar model, by the time we get to the Reformation, people aren't solving things in council. We know that. You all know basic church history enough to know that there was a pope at the time of the Reformations. So what happens is that with the collapse of Roman administration in the West in the fifth century, travel among the, the diocese or Episcopal provinces pretty much becomes impossible. Um, there's too much warfare, there's too much travel, things, law and order has just broken down. And of the five ancient patriarchates, that is the five bishops who were the most well-respected and the most um, important in the church, uh, there's only one that remains in the western half of the empire after the west falls to the various barbarian tribes that invade the western roman empire and this one ancient part patriarchate the bishop of rome gradually assumes more and more and more imp importance in the medieval western europe um, some of this was the result of existential problems facing the medieval church. Some of this was because of the backing of more powerful medieval kings uh, with the, behind the Bishop of Rome. But regardless, by the time we get to the 14th century, a thousand years after the Council of Nicaea, that Bishop of Rome has become known as Papa, or the Pope, over Western Europe. And the various popes are in claiming increasingly exaggerated powers over the West. Now, fair fellow bishops who were technically equal in dignity and authority in the church continually challenged the popes. This is not a, a case of the pope being unchallenged in his increasingly aggrandized position in the Western church, but it's just this gradual statement um, and attribution of power to the pope. No one in the church quite lost sight of conciliar authority, but canon law, the law of the church, came to define a proper council, as, excuse me, as one who had been called by the church. So instead of a council being a spontaneous gathering of bishops to decide questions, it became a gathering of bishops under the authority of the pope to decide questions in the church. This gives weight to the papal theory that they are supreme over all the rest of the bishops, 
Reformers in the church uh, by the 11th and 12th and 13th centuries are calling for reform of the papacy first in order to reform the bishops and the rest of the councils of the church. This is where we get back to the question of reform in head and members. The idea was that you had to reform the papacy and the cardinals that were under the papacy in order to reform the rest of the church, uh, the bishops on down to deacons and the faithful uh, underneath the pope's authority. But medieval popes, nonetheless, are claiming exaggerated power. I want you to get an idea of just how much power the popes were claiming. So this is a letter that Pope Boniface VIII made. It is called Unum Sanctum. It's the Latin for one holy, as in one holy Catholic and apostolic church in 1302. And it's the most extravagant claim to papal authority in all of history. Here's what Boniface has to say. Urged by faith, we are obliged to believe and maintain that the church is one holy Catholic and also apostolic. So far we're on board with Boniface. We believe in her firmly and we confess with simplicity that outside of her, this one holy Catholic and apostolic church, there is neither salvation nor the remission of sins. He goes on to define the church. We are informed by the text of the Gospels that in this church and in its power are two swords, namely the spiritual and the temporal. Both, therefore, are in the power of the church, that is to say, the spiritual and the material sword, but the former is to be administered for the church, but the latter by the church. The former in the hands of the priest, the latter by the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the will and sufferance of the priest. However, one sword ought to be subordinated to the other, and temporal authority should be subjected to spiritual power. For with truth as our witness, it belongs to spiritual power to establish the terrestrial power and to pass judgment if it has not been good. This authority, though it has been given to man and is exercised by man, is not human, but rather divine, granted to, P to Peter by a divine word and reaffirmed to him, Peter, and his successors by the one whom Peter confessed. Therefore, whoever resists this power of thus ordained by God resists the ordinance of God. Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. All right, let's talk about what's going on here. Uh, wrong slide. These are extraordinary claims by Pope Boniface. Boniface says in essence that the mark of the visible church, the true visible church, is a church that is subordinate to the Pope in all things, uh, the Pope being the successor of Peter here in this text, and that the Pope is in fact the head of the church. There's a sentence that I cut out there for time that says that the head of the church is Christ and his and the vicar of Christ, that is the Pope. So this is an extraordinary claim on behalf of the Pope. He is claiming that no one may be saved unless they are submissive to his own authority and power. And if you notice, he's also claiming absolute authority over all the kings and princes and governmental authorities in Europe as well. And not even in Europe, but he extends his claim to the Greek East. And so this is the Pope claiming to have absolute authority over every matter in the entire world, civil or spiritual. It's astounding that anybody would make this kind of claim. Um, I want to emphasize, however, that although the popes were claiming this amount of power, Boniface himself had no ability to enforce it. In fact, only a few months after Boniface published this letter around Europe, uh, he was kidnapped by agents of the French king, he was tortured, um, and he died. So, so much for his absolute power over politics and spiritual things. Boniface is dead. His successors cannot enforce this decree. Um, it certainly goes against the biblical um, model that suggests that civil authority is appointed directly to by God, and that God is the ultimate uh, is the ultimate head over uh, civil government and civil authority. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
Boniface isn't, this Unum Sanctum bull is the height of medieval papacy's claims, but it doesn't go unchallenged. William of Ockham, writing just shortly thereafter, after uh, Unum Sanctum, had this to say, you know Ockham because of Ockham's razor? He's the guy who came up with both. He was a really brilliant uh, English scholar in the 14th century. And Ockham said, our faith is not formed by the wisdom of the Pope, for no one, is bound to believe the Pope in matters which are of faith, unless he can demonstrate the reasonableness of what he says by the rule of faith, that is by the sacred texts and, and through logic. So Boniface may claim that he is the absolute head of the church on earth, but he's being challenged even in his own day by people who recognize the corruption within the papacy in the 14th century and are saying that it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't mesh with biblical teaching to say that the Pope is the absolute authority on spiritual matters in the world. In any case, the papacy was refusing to recognize much of the authority of the other bishops in the church at this point. Uh, the papacy was starting not even to recognize its own responsibilities. In fact, just a few years after Boniface wrote, the papacy uh, moved from the Bishop of Rome. They pack up the entire papal court and they move from the city of Rome to the town of Avignon, which is in southern France. The green here are papal territories that were ruled directly by the Pope in central Italy. And over to the left in southern France, if you can tell this is a Mediterranean map, this green over here is the little enclave of Avignon where the Pope set up his new court. This means that the Pope is abandoning his chief responsibility, the one title that gives him any claim to authority, which is Bishop of Rome. He abandons the city. It causes a great scandal in European Christendom. Um, people cannot believe that the, the Bishop of Rome is now essentially under the authority of the French king. And it, it causes a great deal of consternation among the writers of the day. Uh, unsure where authority really resides in the church now that the Pope is in France and under the thumb of the King of France. To make matters worse, while they're in Avignon, the various popes and their court, they build extravagant palaces and pleasure grounds for themselves. They build this huge enclave with, with gardens and you know just the, the Renaissance prince kind of life in Avignon, at the same time, the Black Death is striking Europe. Now, we've all had a little bit of experience of a pandemic this year. The Black Death was a thousand times worse than th this year's pandemic. So the faithful in Europe, Christians in Europe, were looking around at the church and finding no source of spiritual comfort in the midst of one of the most extraordinarily awful centuries in human history. Um, and they're seeing the popes simply shut themselves away from disease in the enclave in Avignon, where corruption and immorality are just running rampant through the papal court. The Christian people in the West are appalled by the behavior of the papacy. Um, Catherine of Siena, who's one of my very favorite medieval writers, actually starts writing to one pope. Uh, and she writes over 300 letters that have survived down to us today in which she demands that the Pope has to give up his wealthy living and his corruption and return to the city of Rome in order to have God's favor. She's remarkable. She's, she's really, uh, she takes the whip to the Pope. But she's this woman in Italy, and, but she sends all these letters to the Pope. She's fascinating. Okay, so that's in the 1370s. By 1377, uh, Catherine's correspondent, Pope Gregory XI, finally returns to Rome. It's 50 years after the papacy first went to Avignon. Um, they return to Rome. The Pope who returns to Rome assumes this is going to be, here he is returning in triumph to the city of Rome. He assumes it's going to be this great moment for the church and they'll be able to reform the corruption that's running rampant in the higher ranks of the church. But uh, Gregory, in 1377, I'm sorry, promptly dies from the rigors of the journey from France back to, ever, to the city of Rome. So now you have no Pope. What happens? They've just returned to Rome. It's Gregory's return to Rome and his death that 
uh, sparks off the major crisis of the church known as the Great Schism. That was what, what we're coming down to, what we'll be talking about next week in terms of conciliarism. Gregory dies uh, early 1378, and Gregory had been one of the more conscientious medieval popes. He had been trying to reconcile kings and avoid warfare. He'd been trying to reunite eastern and western halves of Christendom to fight off the encroaching Muslim armies, and he tried to restore order to the church by returning to Rome and attempting to end corruption in the Curia, the papal court. Unfortunately, when Gregory died, uh, he was French, and you know he'd been uh, essentially lived his whole adult life in Avignon in France. And all of the cardinals that he had appointed to uh, their position during his papacy were French. And the French cardinals were hated by the Italians. The mob of people in the city of Rome itself uh, despised the French cardinals that had come out of Avignon. And when Gregory died, the mob from the city of Rome, a whole bunch of families from Rome, uh, the leading men, people from all over Italy, marched into the enclave where the cardinals were meeting and forced the cardinals at knife point to elect the first Italian pope in the 50 years since the Avignon papacy started. So, so much for the, the pope being the absolute head of the church. Now the pope has been elected at knife point. Um, this is the, the pope they elected is the Italian Urban VI. Urban, being the Italian he was, promptly did a very Italian thing. Um, he did a number of Italian things that ticked off the French cardinals. So within a month after he was elected, all of the French cardinals, which was the majority of them, packed up from Rome and went back to Avignon. Once they were in safety in Avignon, away from the Roman mob, they and deposed Urban VI, they voted to depose Pope Urban, they declared that he was a heretical pope, a schismatic, and they elected their own pope, who was, surprise, surprise, a Frenchman. So now this is a problem in Europe, because Boniface has just issued this grand decree at the beginning of the 14th century that said in order to, for salvation, in order to gain salvation, everyone had to be subject to the Roman pontiff, the Roman pope. But now the situation in Avignon, Rome is that you have two popes. How do you know where your allegiance is? How do you know where the head of the church is when there's two people claiming to be the absolute authority over both temporal and spiritual matters in Western Europe? So we have Urban in, in Italy and we have this guy named Clement VII, whose name you don't have to remember, as the new Pope in France. What would you do? Well, if you're Urban, the Italian Pope, what you're gonna do is refuse to withdraw from the papacy. You had just been elected. You're not gonna let the Frenchman tell you what to do. So he insists on remaining as Pope in the city of Rome. And he gets a number of kings throughout Europe to agree with him. This is a map of the different allegiances of the European kingdoms and principalities to the French Pope versus the Italian Pope. England and the Holy Roman Empire back to the Italian Pope, France and most of Spain back to the French Pope in Avignon. Everyone in Europe took sides. This is like the American Civil War. It's brother against brother. Uh, it's causing scandal. Uh, Certainly it's a matter of spiritual warfare, but it also broke out as a matter of physical warfare. People kill each other over the question of who the Supreme Pontiff of the church actually is. Who is the real Pope? Is he Italian or French? There was just general uproar. The Italian and French Popes excommunicated each other and all of their followers. And the situation doesn't resolve immediately. So now these two rival popes are doing things like appointing two rival bishops for each city. Well, so how do you, if you're just an ordinary Christian in one of those cities, how do you know who to follow? The bishops, the elders in the church have been the, the, the main authority at sort of a local level for a very long time. And now there's two bishops overlapping and fighting for authority in every Christian city. Everyone from kings to peasants took sides. And it was a stalemate. 
because the Western church had become very used to the centralized authority of the papacy. So no one really knew what to do. This is when the idea of conciliarism is revived. That is, theologians start talking about how in the old days of the church, during the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, and during the Council of Nicaea in 325, there had been councils of bishops that had been supreme over the doctrine and practice of the church. This was the, before the popes had declared uh, the extent of their power. So theologians start to use these conciliar models, the old ecumenical councils, as models for proposing how to solve this stalemate of the great schism of having multiple popes. They begin to propose that if a council were called in Europe uh, to settle the matter of who the real pope is, that that council would have higher authority than the pope because the Holy Spirit would then be meeting in the, the council of bishops rather than speaking to just one bishop as the Pope. Now, this is, this situation of the Great Schism continues for 40 years. During this time, this is immediately after the Black Death, people in Europe are dealing with famine, they're dealing with hunger, they're dealing with labor shortages. They're dealing with the Hundred Years' War between England and France. This is the time of Joan of Arc. This is the time of, uh, whatever I was saying, the Hundred Years' War. Uh, ordinary people are just, they're facing the worst circumstances uh, in Europe since the collapse of Rome a whole thousand years before. Um, I'm hoping this resonates well with us as well, because sometimes it can feel like 2020 is kind of a collapsing society. And I want to reassure you that Christians and the church have survived collapsing societies before. They survived the collapse of Rome. Uh, they're going to survive the 14th century collapse and this great schism as well. Christ promised that his church would survive even though the very gates of hell were against it. And the 14th century represents a pretty significant attack um, on the church. So the church that Jesus prayed would remain one is now being torn in a million pieces as people debate who the proper head is. And remember, people still believed that you had to reform the church from head and then members rather than from grassroots up. So theologians, most notably uh, a guy named Pierre Dyke, Pierre Daly and another one named Jean Gerson start talking about conciliarism and councils being the true head of the church. War was tried to solve this issue of the rival popes. Diplomacy was tried. Nobody would budge. Uh, one of the Italian, the Italian pope died. They elected a new Italian. The French pope died. They elected a new Frenchman. There are still two popes. So what happens next? Oh, that's my next week. So I just have to tell you what happens next. Sorry. Okay, this is a scandal for Christianity. There's no one knows where proper authority of the visible church is. They all know that the Bible is the proper authority for the church, but for the visible organizational church that medieval Europe is used to dealing with, nobody knows where proper authority is. So they suggest that the bishop starts suggesting that they call a general council in the spirit of Nicaea to resolve the dispute. Uh, there's some pushback because again, popes were supposed to call the councils. They weren't sure what to do. The first meeting, uh, but finally the, the popes agreed to call a general council. The first meeting of the council was at Pisa, the city in Northern Italy here um, on the West coast of Italy. And it was in 1409 and it still took them 15 different sessions to finally vote on something to do with the popes. What they did, uh, this sort of semi-solution, was that the, the council at Pisa voted to depose both the Italian and the French popes um, to deprive them of their papacy. And they accused them of being schismatics, heretical, perjuring, scandalous priests. So pretty hefty weight of charges against these two popes. They deposed them, but then the Peace and Council elect a new cardinal to replace both of these popes as the new pope. But guess what happens? Neither of the other two popes wants to step down. So now in Europe, we have not one pope, we have not two popes, but we have three popes claiming absolute uh, 
undivided authority over Western Christendom. Talk about a scandal in the church. I'll tell you that at this time, Muslim writers also pointed to the Great Schism as proof of why people should convert to Islam over Christianity. This is, I cannot emphasize how big this scandal was to have three different popes in the Christian church. The new pope that they elected, the third pope, immediately told the council at Pisa to go home that he was the new pope. So the council dispersed and they leave this, the situation of new pope for another five years. Finally, in 1414, the new pope, who was named John the 23rd, um, there's a new John the 23rd in the 20th century, so they kind of overlap their numbers. Some people count him as a real pope, some people count him as an anti-pope, it's just, it's a whole thing. But the new pope calls a new general council of bishops, and this time he's going to hold the city up here in the Holy Roman Empire at the city of Constance. Constance at the time represented fairly neutral territory. It was neither Italian nor French. It couldn't be governed by either the Italians or the French uh, various interests. So they wouldn't have any interest in electing one of the three rival popes uh, that were you know, floating around out there in Avignon and Rome. The various kings of Europe were fed up with the schism that had lasted now for 40 years. So they threw their weight behind this new council that was meeting in the city of Constance. And they declared that they would follow any of the decrees that were issued by the Council of Constance. So we're gonna talk about the Council of Constance more next week because it has really interesting ramifications for the development of Presbyterian history. As these bishops get together, they depose all three popes, they create a new cardinal as the new pope, and then they proceed to still meet in council to try and reform all of the abuses of the church that they've seen. And in fact, looking back from the perspective of the Reformation, if Constance had been able to be enforced, which, uh, spoiler, spoiler alert here, they didn't quite enforce all the decrees of the Council of Constance, but it might have prevented the kind of reformation that happened in the 16th century. So Constance is the pre-Reformation council that takes this old model of Acts 15 and of the Council of Nicaea and attempts to apply it to the late medieval Renaissance church before Luther ever starts writing his 95 theses. So next week we're going to talk about the Council of Constance, the various things it does to end the schism. Uh, we'll talk about the decree that the Council of Constance issued. It's a very interesting document called Hyc Sancta in uh, 1415. So if you feel like looking up information about it this week, you'll be ahead of the game when we talk about it next week. And then we'll continue to talk about what this medieval conciliar movement, what this medieval council has to do with church government and theories of church government as it's set up by modern Presbyterians today. So I'm done with my lecture. I'm here to take questions now for the next five minutes. You for what you just gave. You're welcome. Any questions, anybody on the 14th century or the Council of Nicaea? Okay, then you all get done a little bit early. Jared, can I ask you to scoot into the shot here and bless us as we close out today? Sure. Father God, we thank you for uh, your wisdom, your power, uh, and your authority. Lord, that we can look to you, that we can uh, fear you and honor you uh, through your wisdom, through your actions, uh, throughout the history of your church. Father, we pray for uh, the coming weeks and months in this world with the uh, crisis of our pandemic, uh, that you would not let uh, the gates of hell prevail over our church. Lord, we pray for uh, the worship service this morning, uh, that you would be glorified in all that we do, uh, 
um, that you would speak your word to our hearts. I pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Joanna. That was great. Yeah. Thank you for your technical assistance. I'll see everybody next week. All right. See you then. Thank Thanks, you. John.